over to Ms. Marukian, and I'm going to change the presenter now. Okay, thank you so much, Tweets. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to see that so many people wanted to join this conversation. Um, as Tweets mentioned, I have studied and trained others on intercultural communication for about 15 years now, working with professionals, uh, students, diplomats, healthcare practitioners, and also educators in um, both public schools as well as higher education. And I have also been a student of culture pretty much my entire life, I would say, although I was born and raised in the United States. And I would describe my upbringing as pretty typical average American uh, childhood and, and, you know, and experiences. But I also grew up in a very multicultural family, um, a family of immigrants. And so my identity and my values were a combination of a variety of different cultures. And I think that that's given me a unique perspe perspective on the idea of identity and culture. And I, I consider myself a lifelong student of culture. I think this is the kind of work that continues uh, for us throughout our entire lives because um, as, as, we, as we continue to grow and develop, we, we get new insights and discover, you know, discover new things about ourselves and other people. So today I'm going to share some of my insights and discovery, some of my knowledge from, uh, from doing this work. And then I'd like to uh, turn it over to you all for your questions, as well as your insights, your personal experiences. How do some of these aspects of uh, cross-cultural communication show up in your life and what, um, you know, what are some practices or what are some questions that you have around that? So I'd like to start with, uh, you know, just making sure we're kind of all on the same page with the, our definition of culture. There are a lot of definitions out there to describe what culture is, and I chose this one by Edward Hall uh, for a few different reasons. Hall was a an anthropologist and a scholar. Uh, he actually did a lot of work with the um, U.S. Department of State back in the 1950s and 60s and really was at the forefront of creating um, an experiential approach to, to cultural learning. Uh, up until that point, most, uh, most U.S. Uh, diplomats going overseas really didn't get any sort of cultural training, sometimes not even language training. And it was really just somebody would hand them a list of what to do and not do, what to say and not say, but not really giving them the deeper understanding of the, the context of culture. And so what Hall really did was by, by focusing on um, what we see here in this definition of culture being a set of symbols and beliefs and assumptions, attitudes, values, expectations and norms for behavior, which get passed down from one generation to the next through our learning and experiences. Uh, he really sort of helped to provide a new, a new framework for looking at cultural understanding that we first have to understand ourselves. We have to reflect on our own beliefs and attitudes and values and how that impacts the way that we see ourselves, uh, the way that we make sense of the world around us the assumptions that we make about what's good or bad, what's right or wrong, what's appropriate or inappropriate behavior, all of that comes from our cultural experiences and upbringing and impacts the way that we see ourselves and others. And um, by, by being able to do that self-reflection first and then providing that in contrast with other cultures, um, as many of you have probably experienced, you know, we don't often, we don't often think too deeply about our culture until we are faced with a situation where we come in contact with people who do not share the same cultural background or values or norms. And it creates that little disconnect, right? So, um, so really, you know, culture doesn't happen in a vacuum. And in order for us to really build these skills, regardless of what um, environment we're in, it really starts with us understanding self. Um, so I like this image because I think going along with that, 
for any of you who have ever experienced the snowfall. I myself am from the from Michigan, and if any of you have ever been there or uh, or or been in some of the other northern Midwestern states, it snows a lot. So this is very uh, very familiar to me. But when it snows, typically what we see from farther away is little tiny white dots coming down to the ground. Um, and they all kind of look the same. But the closer that we get, the more we can start to identify some of the distinctions between those individual snowflakes. And if you look at a snowflake under a microscope, you really can see the intricate uh, differences and just how, just how multidimensional they are. Um, and I think that that's an important element to understanding culture because it's really the same when it comes to our identity. Culture isn't static or universal. We can't say that everyone from one particular culture is going to believe or, or act the same way or share the exact same values um, because we all as individuals live our culture differently. So this really is, I think, an important element, foundational element to the conversation that we're going to be having today, that this is not to put people in boxes or to assume that anyone from one particular nation or one particular region is all going to think and act the same way. Um, and yet there are some general patterns that can help us to make sense of um, how we might be experiencing one another differently. Uh, similarly, as individuals, we all walk around looking through the at looking at the world through our own individual window panes, and uh, those window panes are constructed of all of those cultural elements that uh, were in that definition earlier, right? Um, my beliefs and assumptions, my core values, my life experiences, uh, my expectations are all going to serve as a filter through which I see. The world around me and impact my expectations and oftentimes we don't think about that again this is implicit right it's unconscious to us many times and we we often as human beings I think assume that there is one reality and that others are looking through the same window pane that we are and that they share the same reality the same sense of what is true that we do, and that's not necessarily the case. Everybody's looking through their own window pane based on their own cultural differences. So I love this quote that we see the world not as it is, but as we are. And I think that's another important element for us as we, as we look at culture and communication is considering uh, where might I be making judgments about others based on my own cultural window pane, my own lens through which I see the world. So let's talk a little bit about how communication impact or how culture impacts communication. Um, so again, those elements of culture, the uh, symbols, beliefs, assumptions, attitudes, values, expectations, and norms of any individual is going to impact first how we communicate out to others, right? Um, how I choose to uh, convey my message to other people is going to be impacted by my culture. And it's also the, the, the other individual's cultural identity and cultural lens will impact the way that they receive that message. So as you can imagine, there is a lot of room for miscommunication to take place when we are coming together and communicating and we both have very different window panes through which we are perceiving ourselves and one another. So some examples, some of these may sound familiar to you. Perhaps once or twice you've had some confusion or frustration around some of these behaviors. And, and again, this is just a short list of the many, <laughs> the many behaviors that sometimes we can, um, we can experience that uh, can make us you know, question what's, what's, that per what's going on with that person. Um, individuals who speak loudly, uh, who speak with a louder tone of voice um, or talk softly, right? And if you look at some of these, um, again, culturally, some people have very different perceptions and expectations around how loudly should somebody be speaking, right? And there's so much room for misperception. Um, oftentimes I hear from people that, you know, 
folks from that group, they talk so loudly, they have come across to us as arrogant or overbearing. Um, and you might have other people that say, I appreciate that, that, that somebody raised their voice because it shows that they're passionate and they care about this, right? So very different perceptions about the, um, just the, the simple act of somebody raising their voice. Or talk softly. Some people, based on their cultural vantage point, may say, if you speak softly, that means that you are weak or that you don't care. Um, and then there may be other folks on the other side that say, speaking softly shows respect, right? So again, there are different perceptions for some of these. Um, isn't emotionally expressive? And we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in a few moments, but um, the, our expectations around how much somebody should show their emotions in their face and their body language um, varies from culture to culture. And uh, for those who have a cultural value around low emotional expressiveness, somebody who shows up with a higher amount of ex emotional expressiveness may be seen as sort of off the rails, like why is this person overreacting so much? Um, and vice versa, for somebody who has an expectation around higher emotional expression and, and interacting with somebody who engages in low emotional expression, they're saying, what's wrong with this person? They, they don't, they're just giving me a, a stone face. I, I can't read them. I don't, I don't know what they're really thinking, right? Um, agrees with others even when they feel differently. This is, a, again, something that we'll talk about in a few moments, but something that I hear often from folks from different cultures. Um, you know, is that agreeableness, especially when you find out that they don't agree, um, some people can perceive that as saving faith, uh, as, you know, maintaining the dignity of the situation. Others may perceive it as dishonesty. Um, inauthenticity. So again, depending on where we're coming from and the vantage point we have, um, these behaviors can, we can read these behaviors very, very differently. On the other hand, openly disagreeing rather than waiting to discuss privately, that can be perceived as, again, sort of overbearing or confrontational, unnecessarily confrontational, right? Um, making unilateral decisions without consulting others versus asking for consensus rather than making decisions. So on one side, you may have people who say, you know, strong decision making, that's, that's the sign of an effective leader, and that's what leaders are supposed to do. Um, that's their responsibility, not ours to tell them what they should be doing. And on the other end, you might have people saying, I can't believe that you, they wouldn't ask my input. This is a decision that everybody should own, not just the leader. So. Again, you know, these very simple behaviors that can sometimes seem so uh, normal and acceptable and appropriate for us, depending on our cultural context, can be misperceived by others. All right, so I have a quiz for you. You don't actually have to answer this, but when you see a stranger on the street smiling at you, what do you assume? A, he is drunk. B, he is insane. He's an American. Um, <laughs> I love this question. This actually showed up in a, uh, there was a quiz that was um, uh, put forth by a, a group of people in Finland, in the country of Finland. And, um, you know, it, it's, I think, a very interesting way of looking at, at Americans because, yeah, there is sort of this, again, cultural expectation about how much should people smile? Um, in, many, in many cultures around the world, there is not an expectation that we have to smile and make eye contact with every single individual with whom we um, interact. In fact, that could be perceived as negative in a lot of ways. Uh, there was a, um, when a lot of U.S. companies uh, go overseas, they, <laughs> They have experienced these issues, especially when they're trying to um, build their space in, in other markets. There was a um, training video for, uh, I think it was Walmart employees in Germany. And the training video was showing uh, the, the person at the, at the checkout counter, the employee, um, American employee, 
smiling and engaging in banter and chatting with the employee. And the training video was saying, this is what our expectations are for you as an employee of Walmart. We want you to smile and engage and, and really, you know, take the time to, to chat, to chat up your, your customers. And the German uh, employees who were watching this video were actually really surprised and, and confused by this because to them, when they were watching that video, they said, this, this person at the checkout counter is flirting with the, with the customer in, in a very, you know, inappropriate way. Um, so again, it's sort of funny what, what appears in, in one culture to be so normal and so a part of the everyday um, mode of communicating can be perceived in a very different way in another culture. Um, and I, you know, I just want to stay on this for a moment because I think it's one that we hear a lot. And it's, it's interesting um, as an opportunity to sort of break down where some of these cultural uh, behaviors come from. So why do Americans smile so much? For some of you who are hailing from cultures where smiling constantly is not necessarily the cultural norm. It might be a little off-putting for you, or it may have been when you first uh, experienced it. And there was a really interesting article, uh, some research that came out and was highlighted in the Atlantic Monthly, which is a um, magazine here in the U.S. And the research showed that, uh, that well, first of all, Countries that have a more multicultural population tend to have higher levels of, um, of people smiling uh, one, at one another. And the reason for this, they said, was that when you think about um, a heterogeneous population, when people are coming from a number of different cultures where they don't speak the same language, they don't share the same cultural norms, they have to look at ways for building relationships and creating a sense of community. And so their, their way of doing that was through smiling, which is, you know, so it, smiling became something that was a frequent part of interactions within the United States. And another reason is that um, when we think about that, that cultural element of values, and I'm going to be spending a lot of time talking about values today, um, Americans, by and large, tend to have a, a value around emotional expressiveness around um, enthusiasm and high energy. It's something that tends to be valued within the, uh, the U.S. society. Um, and what the research found was that typically in cultures where um, emotional expressiveness combined with high energy and enthusiasm and general sort of happiness indicators, when, the, when happiness and high energy were considered to be uh, highly valued, you tended to see people smile more. So again, you know, kind of funny when we think about it, on the surface, it doesn't seem like it should make that much of a difference, but the mere act of smiling um, and how often and how big we smile uh, can have a lot of different cultural elements underneath it. Okay, so let's talk about some of these cultural dimensions at work and how they might show up. There are many different dimensions. I chose to focus on five that I think typically tend to have the largest impact on our understanding and communication in the workplace. So this whole notion of me versus we, we're going to talk a little bit about this. Um, I think it's one of the most important distinctions that we tend to hear between uh, what's typically considered the general U.S. population, the U.S. culture, and, and many other cultures around the world. So let's talk a little bit about what this means. Um, me versus we being individualism versus collectivism. So individualist cultures tend to focus on self-actualization. Collectivist cultures tend to focus on harmony or consensus. So again, the goals for those cultures in terms of how they interact and how they succeed is very different. Um, identity and the individual side is based on I, right? Um, core values around independence. I'm in charge of my own destiny. I can only rely on myself for success versus collective cultures, which are really the identity based on the group, on we. We are codependent. We are interdependent with one another. Our strength lies in our collective, in our community. Um, 
but it's also uh, it impacts people's behaviors, right? So in an individualist culture, uh, it's important to speak one's mind, and people tend to value sorry that should be tasks but value tasks over relationships, and there's a sense of a right to privacy and free speech, right? I have my rights and no one can violate them. On the collectivist side, it's important to save space to preserve the dignity of self and others in any given situation. There's a value of, of relationship over task accomplishment, and private life is, is much more open to the group. Now again, these are generalizations and not meant to define an entire group of people, but I think sometimes again, a starting place for us to start to realize where might these, um, where might these behaviors that we, that we perceive, where are they coming from, right? So if you've ever felt confused or turned off because, you know, in your, in your workplace, there's this expectation for people to brag about themselves um, or a focus of self instead of group, um, individual success versus group success, this might be playing into it. Um, it can impact expectations on who uh, is perceived as, um, who should be promoted or rewarded and for what behaviors, uh, how people are perceived in meetings based on what and how they communicate with one another. Um, and it also can impact how much people are willing to share about themselves with one another. Another dimension uh, that plays out a lot in cross-cultural workplace situations is the notion of who's in charge, right? Power and autonomy, um, this notion of hierarchy and who has, who has the power. Um, let's talk a little bit about low versus high power distance. In a low power distance culture, it's um, ex not only acceptable but expected that leaders will be challenged by the people who follow them. Um, equality is an important value. Uh, consultative leadership styles tend to be um, expected in terms of leaders building consensus, reaching out to, to others. Uh, respect for leaders is actually viewed, at, you know, viewed when people provide input or feedback to the leaders. Um, and power tends to be more decentralized. It tends to float out more broadly across the organization. In high power distance cultures, it's, it's different, right? Leaders, um, it's not acceptable to challenge leaders or it's frowned upon. Um, inequalities are accepted to a certain extent uh, in terms of, you know, um, sometimes it's based on, on age, sometimes it's based on seniority levels, uh, but there tend to be more expectations that there are certain people who are going to automatically um, be given deference because of some aspect of their identity. Uh, it's a much more autocratic leadership style ten, uh, tendency. So again, the leader is the one to make the decisions. The leader is the one who's seen as in charge, um, not necessarily expected or encouraged to consult um, or get input from their employees. Uh, respect for leaders is, is um, viewed when, when employees obey, um, and power tends to be more centralized. So this can, again, impact expectations around how leaders and managers should behave in the workplace, how they should interact with their employees, um, how employees should interact with their bosses. Uh, it can also have a major impact on how um, conflict is brought forth and dealt with and how decisions are made, which can have, which again can have huge impacts in our workplace relationships. Okay, so number three, what are you trying to say? Major communication differences um, across cultures in terms of how explicit or implicit our messaging is, how much we rely on quote-unquote straight talk versus subtle cues to communicate to others. So I want to talk a little bit about this notion of explicit versus implicit, and we're going to refer to this as high context versus low context communication. In low context communication, this more direct form of communication, it really relies on the explicit. This is where you hear people say, I say what I mean and I mean what I say, right? I'm a straight shooter. I get right to the point. Um, what, whatever I say to you is what I am trying to convey, more or less. Uh, high context cultures tend to reply, rely on implicit communication and nonverbal cues. Um, there's a subtlety to the way that people communicate messages 
Um, and communication is seen as an art form versus a way of exchanging communication, uh, which is tended, the tendency in a low-context low culture. Um, and then finally, in low-context versus high-context cultures, when you think about relationship building, there's a very big difference there as well. Uh, low-context cultures, relationships can begin and end pretty quickly. Um, trust can be built fairly quickly. Uh, and, you know, and there's, there's not as much of a, of a belief or an expectation that those relationships are going to, uh, are going to be extended beyond the life of the, um, of the workplace day or so on and so forth. Um, relationships in high context cultures are built more slowly and tend to rely heavily on trust building. So again, sort of this, this difference in our expectations around communication, how much we express uh, both verbally and non-verbally is an important um, distinction. Uh, people can easily become frustrated or even offended when our expectations around directness or indirect directness don't match, right? Um, low context communicators often find themselves very confused or sometimes even angry um, with their high context colleagues because they've missed a critical part of the message. And then high context colleagues are scratching their heads and saying, why is this low context colleague so angry with me? <laughs> I, made my, I made my point. Uh, as clearly as I possibly could. So a lot of times there's just a disconnect in terms of our expectations. Um, and it can really impact trust in relationships. A lot of times what I hear from folks who come from different sides of, of this um, context dimension, uh, from low context communicators, many times they perceive high context communicators as um, either disingenuous or sometimes even dishonest. Um, I've heard often, and again, you can probably see where this uh, can, you know, these lines can be drawn between U.S. culture being much more low context and other, some other cultures being more high context. Um, a lot of U.S. Uh, employees will say, that person lies, um, that person's dishonest, I can't trust them, uh, or they are avoiding having the tough conversation, and therefore, I don't, I don't trust that I understand what they really think. Um, and the members of the high context culture saying, I am, I'm trying to, in as respectful a way as possible, convey my meaning, but this person just doesn't get it. Um, we see this a lot in this notion of when we say yes and when we say no. And um, I, I've had many conversations with folks from different cultures around this idea of how do you tell someone no? In a low context culture, you tell someone no by saying, no. <laughs> in a more high context culture, there are very uh, much more subtle ways in which we communicate no, right? Uh, what I've heard from people in terms of examples is maybe, <laughs> right? That might be difficult. Um, I will try to get to that at some point. Um, inshallah, <laughs> right? Or sometimes not even actual verbal phrases, but just nonverbals in terms of uh, avoiding making eye contact or sucking in the breath um, or frowning a little bit. And so members of low context cultures can sometimes, when they're not trained to understand the difference, can sometimes misinterpret that no for a yes. And then they find themselves really confused and frustrated when they're not getting what they thought they were going to get from that colleague. So um, really, really interesting and important, uh, you know, element around our cultural communication. Another aspect that I think plagues teams, and especially when it comes to manager and employee relationships, is this whole notion of get the job first or build the relationship first. And in some cultures that are task-oriented, task-focused, it's all about let's get the job done first, then we'll get to know each other. Uh, negotiations tend to be completed when a contract is signed. Uh, and decisions tend to be made in the meetings where people have said they're going to make the decisions. In relationship-focused, relationship-oriented cultures, the focus first and foremost is on getting to know one another, on building that relationship, on, on talking about um, non-work related elements, trying to understand one another, and then working on getting the job done. Negotiations tend to be based on relationships, contracts are seen as a formality, and decisions often are made before or after the meeting, not in the meeting itself. 
So again, these are some generalizations, but thinking about some of the core values that may be underpinning some of these cultural differences. Uh, for task-oriented people, the notion of productivity, the notion of conscientiousness, and again, kind of, I did what I said I would do. Um, pride in doing more with less. Uh, and, and, and again, I think this ties back to that individualist piece. Um, making sure that I can say I got the job done. It's not that relationships are not important to task-focused cultures. It's where they fall in terms of priority when we're looking at our workplace relationships and expectations around doing work. Um, Relationship-focused individuals may have more of a value around, um, around family, around community. So again, we might see that difference between individualists and collectivists playing out here. Um, this can have a huge impact on deadlines and priorities, on how people approach the workday and use their time. Uh, again, it's not that relationship-focused individuals are not capable or willing to focus on the task. It's, again, it comes down to where we prioritize our time and what needs to come first, the sequence by which we can conduct the task. Um, Again, this can have a huge impact on what people are rewarded or punished for and how and when decisions get made. So um, really important to have an understanding of where our colleagues, our bosses, our employees may be coming from and how that might be similar to or different from our own. And then one final cultural dimension I wanted to touch upon is this notion of when is now and time orientation. I was um, recently talking with a colleague who spent uh, spent some time in South Africa, and she said as an American in South Africa, uh, it was really interesting to learn new language language around what now, the word now meant, um, that when she would ask a South African employee to get her a report, um, if the employee said, I'll get that to you just now, just now pretty much meant I'll get around to it when I get to it. Um, it may be in an hour, it may be at the end of the day today, I'll get it to you, but it's kind of, you know, it's not a huge priority to me. Versus now, now, which means, okay, immediately, that's when you want it. So, so again, these subtle differences in language can have a huge impact on our expectations, um, on when deadlines will be met, uh, on when we will show up to events and meetings, uh, which there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of comical stories around that, but there can also be some very serious challenges when people start to judge one another based on that time orientation. So on one side, you have monochronic time. People tend to look at time as uh, linear. We do one thing at a time. It's sequential. There's a sense of order and structure. And being on time is a really important concern versus polychronic time where multiple things might be going on at once. Um, we may be willing to change plans as the needs arise, and, and people are the main concern. So in polychronic cultures, um, if I'm heading to work and I know I have a meeting at 8 o'clock, but I run into uh, a dear friend on the way, I'm not going to say, I can't talk to you, dear friend, because I have to get to my 8 o'clock meeting. In a monochronic culture, if I run into that dear friend and say, let's catch up tomorrow, um, I'll put it on my calendar, but I have to get to this meeting at 8 o'clock. So again, it's not about judging one as better than the other. It's just simply recognizing that this is the vantage point that people are coming from. Okay, great. So we know all of this stuff now. How do we really communicate effectively across cultures? I'm going to give you some very sort of high-level ideas, and then if you're interested, we can talk a little bit more about what these look like in practice. Um, first and foremost, I know it sounds so simple, but pay close attention to communication cues, both verbal and nonverbal. Becoming more mindful of your own communication, uh, how the words that you say, how your body language um, may impact the way that people understand your messaging is really important. And also paying more attention to others and considering what you may be inferring or misunderstanding based on their body language or their verbal actions. Assuming good intent, or at least not bad intent. Uh, most people want to do good. They want to, they consider themselves to be sensitive uh, individuals and considerate individuals. Um, 
but we all can make mistakes. And again, as we talked about earlier, the impact of our actions are not always aligned with our intent. So it really starts with managing your own emotional reactions to the behaviors that you perceive in others. Uh, be careful of judging people's behaviors as good or bad simply because it's different from your own. And really start to think about what, what else might be going on there. Uh, hand in hand with that goes this notion of getting curious and asking questions. The more diverse the environment, the more important it is for us to make sense and check our understanding of what might be going on. And I would suggest, in addition to this, that it's important to listen for language that people use that may help you get insight into what their core values are. Um, so by watching and listening to what people are saying, not just to the words that they're saying, but what the meaning is underneath that. What do they care most about? Do they care about relationships and family and community? Do they care about getting the job done and productivity and timeliness? What, you know, um, if you hear people talking about honesty, checking in and trying to find out what does honesty look like for you? What are the behaviors and actions that others engage in that either make you feel that they're honest or make you feel that they're dishonest? Um, so checking our assumptions even about those values and the behaviors related to them, really important. Um, and then finally, step out of your comfort zone. Uh, for many of you, you're already finding yourself outside of your comfort zone every day when you're in a multicultural environment. Uh, but really trying to push beyond um, and, and try, try to engage in behaviors that may not feel natural um, and in your own home life may feel wrong. Uh, but try, be willing to, to try them on for size and see how they, um, see how they impact your relationships with others. Um, it means sometimes that we're going to be wrong. It means sometimes we're going to make communication mistakes. And I think stepping out of our comfort zone also means that we have to, we have to be willing to grow from our mistakes and also to ask for others' input and feedback so that we have a deeper understanding of, um, of how we're being perceived by others. And also step out of your comfort zone in terms of giving feedback to your colleagues or your um, or employees when they're engaging in behaviors that for you culturally doesn't feel appropriate or right, or perhaps you're having some, some you know, anxiety or frustration about their actions. Checking in and asking to try to understand their intention and letting them know how you perceive that action can sometimes feel very uncomfortable, but can actually lead to much stronger relationships in the long run. So those were the, oh, and one more, sorry. Use simple, direct language and assume your message may be interpreted. I think a lot of times we assume that everyone's going to get what we're saying. Um, but again, taking a step back and preparing, especially if it's an important message that you want to get across, take some time to really craft that message in a way that's going to be culturally appropriate um, for the person on the receiving end so that they can really hear it. All right. So, um, I feel like I have talked enough. I wanted to provide some resources for you, um, a few books and articles that uh, a lot of this research is based on for your viewing pleasure. Um, but I also wanted to turn it over to, to you all and you know hear your comments, your experiences, your questions, and I will do my best to answer them. Okay, well thank you, Maria. That was fantastic and really interesting and insightful. Um, so now, as she said, there's this opportunity to ask questions. You can type them in the chat box. Uh, the first question that we got was, how do you strike a balance between being an individual within a group, so you fit into the group, and not lose yourself as an individual? Oh, really good question. Yeah. Uh, wow. Um, so how do you how do you strike that balance? Um, you know, I. I think it, it depends on the situation and on what's most important to you. Um, there is, there's something, you know, I think stepping back and asking some questions is always a good place to start. Uh, so for me, typically what I'll do is ask questions in terms of um, what, what, what can I do or say that's going to best serve the team or the organization? 
um, what behaviors do I naturally engage in that support the organization? What behaviors do I naturally engage in that maybe don't? Um, and where, you know, another question that I often ask myself when it comes to striking that balance is um, in any particular situation, is this, a, I'm trying to think of a particular example, but is this an instance where um, it's important to me, it's important enough to me to stand out? Um, and I guess what I mean by that is if I feel very strongly based on my values and my morals that a decision is being made that I, I feel is, is going against what I care most deeply about, um, I'm, you know, I'm going to weight that differently in terms of whether I decide to speak out versus, well, it's not something that's that important to me. And when I step, step back and think about it, maybe I need to let go of some of my own desires to best serve the group. So I don't know if that's helpful, but I think coming up with a couple of questions that can sort of be your litmus test uh, for when you believe personally it's most important to stand out um, versus when you believe it's important to be a part of the, you know, to, to be a part of the group or do what's best for the group, even if it means sacrificing um, your own needs in that moment. As leaders, I think a lot of times it is incumbent on us to strike that balance. The, the higher up you go as a, as a leader, you know, there's this notion of servant leadership. It's not my job to, um, it's not my job to, to, to be the, the winner, right? Um, it's my responsibility to serve my, my team, to serve my organization, to uphold the values of the organization. So the decisions that I make are always going to be in service of what's best for the group and the organization. But sometimes that may lead me to make a decision where I, I voice dissension. Um, another aspect I think I would put into that is, is this going to be, um, is this particular situation impacting my health and wellness? or the health and wellness of my family or people I care about negatively. And that might be another instance where, again, related to my own code, my own moral code, I might have to step forth and, and look out for myself and make a decision that's more self-focused than other-focused. So I don't know if that answers your question, but um, hopefully that gives you a couple of thoughts in terms of identifying the questions that are most important for you. Great. Okay. The next question is, how do you manage colleagues that talk too slow or too fast? Mm. Um, whew. Well, so with the colleagues that talk too slow, I, to a certain extent, sometimes I think patience is required. <laughs> I, am, I am one of those people as an extroverted individual who will often mistake a comma for a period when other people are talking. I'll think that they've finished their thought and I'll try to jump in before they've completed what they wanted to say. So I found that um, sometimes I need to just manage myself and allow people to have a little bit more space to talk, even if they are speaking more slowly. Um, that being said, if it becomes really problematic, you might have to have a conversation and ask somebody, um, is it possible, I want to make sure that your point is heard by others because you have really good um, insights that we all need to hear. And I think sometimes people lose focus of what you're trying to say. Um, so, you know, it, it may be giving that person some feedback to encourage them to be more focused um, on what they're saying. With the people that are talking too fast, I think it's okay to just ask them to slow down a little bit. <laughs> Um, most likely, if you're noticing that an individual is talking too fast, then other people are experiencing that too. And I think the same feedback can apply to say, you've got really good input, and because you talk so quickly, I think sometimes people miss the really important elements that you're trying to get across. So maybe just slow it down a little bit um, so that we can, we can catch that. So hope that's helpful. 
Okay, I think that's helpful. Um, what clue should I know when my action or words offend my colleague's belief? Hmm. What words should I know when my uh, what clue? Sorry, what clue what clues, should I know yeah. when when they offend their colleagues? Uh, you know yes. that it might look different again, depending on on who the colleague is. Um, I think most times in in professional environments, people are not going to directly say, "You have offended me." Uh, so I, you know, it, it sometimes means that we have to be hypersensitive to those nonverbal cues. Um, it may be that that person lowers their head and doesn't make eye contact or that they all of a sudden become quiet when before they were talkative. Um, uh, so, you know, I think any sort of nonverbal gestures that show that somebody is withdrawing, it could be a signal that that person was offended. Um, another element is they could get defensive. Um, they may start to argue or try to justify uh, where they're coming from. And um, so they may not be showing up angrily, but they may be showing some level of frustration or defensiveness. Um, and if that's the case, I think just simply checking in with them privately and asking them. Uh, I, I like the idea of calling attention to specific behaviors rather than saying, you seemed offended by what I said today, um, which is fine. But a better way might be, hey, I noticed that you you stopped talking after I said or did X, Y, or Z. Um, just wanted to check in with you to see what that was about. If you have any opinions um, or any you know any feedback for me about about that conversation. Okay. The next question is how to say no to extra work when you are already overworked. That's a good question. Oh my gosh, I wish I had the answer to that because I struggle with that constantly. Um, I think that you know what I have found to be really useful when it comes to saying no is uh, being able to make the case for um, quality versus quantity and uh, telling the, the person who's trying to assign me the work that, you know, I just want to, I just want to show you these are all of the other um, deliverables or projects that I'm currently working on that um, I believe, it's my understanding these are a top priority. And I am very concerned that if I take on this additional project and that also is a priority, that it's going to compromise the quality of the deliverable, and I would never want to do that. Um, so, can we can we talk about some alternative options uh, that might be available to to figure out the best way, if, you know, for me to manage my my workload and deliver the best quality product, um, but also to you know continue to support the team as best I can. Okay, our next question is, how do you navigate in a work environment where emphasis is placed on employees' accents? Is there a meeting point between trying to communicate effectively and maintaining the originality of your cultural background in terms of grammatical accents? Ooh, wow. Um, really interesting question. Hmm. That is, you know, I think that's a tough one. I think it's, you know, maybe the starting point is to try to get a better understanding of what's behind that expectation. Um, because, you know, if it is a matter of people not truly not being able to understand what you're saying, then that can be, that can be a, a detriment to you and your success. Um, so it may be that you do have to, to, to work on um, making sure that your communication is clear enough. That being said, I think if it's a matter of, um, what do I want to say? If it's a matter of uh, trying to get everyone to fit into and be very homogeneous um, and scrub accents, I, 
I don't know. I guess um, personally I would really struggle with that if I were the employee because, um, you know, your accent is part of who you are. So I, I guess I would start with having a, a conversation with perhaps with your supervisor and just trying to get a little bit more understanding of what's behind that expectation um, and, and to be able to convey, of course, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm understood and, you know, that I have, you know, that, that people clearly understand the meaning that I'm trying to convey. Uh, but I also am proud of who I am and I'm proud of my heritage. And I don't believe that it is possible or probable for me to, um, to completely lose that accent because that's who I am. So, yeah, I guess I would, you know, it's, there's a, there's, I think, an opportunity to, um, get some clarity, but also to perhaps provide some insight to that organization's leadership that what they may be asking for is potentially not very inclusive behavior. Okay, so that looks like that's all the questions that we have at this point. Unless there's a straggler in there who just thought of something brilliant you want to share, please feel free. Uh, I'll give you another couple seconds to write down your questions. And these are really good questions. Thank you all for asking them. I think this is this is difficult stuff. If um, you know, if these were easy answers, we you know we would all have figured it out, right? This is, it's complex, and we're dealing with we're dealing with human beings who bring their own. Uh, their own lenses and their own unconscious uh, presumptions sometimes to the table. So, you know, when you find yourself in, in a setting where, especially if you feel like you're kind of one of the sole representatives of the, the you know, the culture that's not the norm, um, it can be frustrating and sometimes exhausting. So I guess my last little bit of advice would also be to just take care of yourself and Give yourself some space every once in a while. You know, we talked earlier about getting out of your comfort zone, but I think there's also a need for us to all uh, replenish um, the, you know, replenish our batteries uh, and make sure that we can come every day with, uh, with a true um, knowledge and connection to who we are. You know, cultural competence is not about losing yourself. And I really love the questions that people were asking around that. Um, it is about being very clear and uh, clear about who you are, and and using that as as your as your foundation to understand and communicate with others without ever losing that the you know the beautiful uh, multi-dimensional aspects of of your identity and your culture. So um, really appreciate the questions that you've asked and. If there are any other questions or comments um, that come up after the webinar, I'd, I'd love to hear them. We'd love to, you know, continue to keep in touch with you all. And um, as Tweet said, there's another webinar coming soon. So um, would love to, you know, have you all participate in that one as well. Um, but, yeah, many thanks to everybody who has participated uh, in today's session. Um, thank you, Maria. That was fantastic and uh, really informative, and I, it looks like people enjoyed it, so that's great. Um, our next webinar is actually November 16th at the same time at 1230. Uh, we will be discussing developing self-awareness in a culturally diverse workplace. Um, that will sort of build on uh, our intro for this webinar. Uh, this webinar will be available after uh, later on today um, if you'd like to, to hear a recording and the uh, presentation is also available. If you have any questions you can obviously feel free to contact us at acca.usa at accaglobal.com that's accaglobal.usa at accaglobal.com um, and we're happy to you know if you think of any additional questions or want additional resources, please feel free to reach out. So again, thank you all for joining us today and hopefully we will see you November 16th. Thanks so much.